Well, we're unveiling a new segment today in partnership with The Week, uh, a magazine, of course, aptly titled, uh, this segment aptly titled as well, The Week That Was, A Look Back, and a look forward, the week that will be as well. The Week.com's deputy editor, Ben Fruman, is our partner in this. And we start off with the president himself, along with his rival, Mitt Romney, and, of course, Bain Capital. And whether this story, uh, which has rattled around for a few months here, will get bigger or smaller come November. What say you, Ben? Well, thanks for having me, Dylan. And uh, as you suggest, uh, over the last week, both President Obama and Mitt Romney have been in a race to, to define Mitt Romney's record uh, at Bain Capital, the private equity firm that he founded and led for several years. Uh, the president launched a pretty brutal uh, attack ad against Mitt Romney, uh, spotlighting a steel factory in Kansas City that uh, Bain took over. And several years later, the, the company goes bankrupt. Hundreds of people lose their jobs. Uh, and Bain uh, pockets millions of dollars. Uh, now of course, this isn't uh, the first time that Mitt Romney has faced an attack like this. Uh, Bain has come up in, in every political race that he's ever run. Uh, his campaign, which is really a well-oiled machine in Boston, uh, was ready. Uh, they uh, rebutted uh, uh, with a slick web video of their own uh, mere hours right. later. Uh, and, you know, we can expect more of this. You know, the president is not eager to run on his own economic record, but the economy, as we all know, stands to be the number one issue in November. Uh, it resonates with, uh, with voters in a way that, that gay marriage or, or even the war in Afghanistan, important as they may be, simply don't, at least not with uh, as wide of a swath of voters. And, uh, you know, for President Obama, much like George W. Bush uh, uh, tried to uh, cast John Kerry's war record as a liability in 2004, uh, you can expect the president to do the same thing with Mitt Romney and Bain. And the other big distinction before we move on to Ron Paul is historically the uh, American awareness of the distinction between extractionary practices and value-creating practices in capitalism really it wasn't part of the narrative. So it was one thing to dismiss Bain five or ten years ago when there wasn't the underlying awareness of just how corrupted the debt markets are. Uh, I would agree with you that I think this is a bigger problem for him, especially in the context of Jamie Dimon and some of these other things, which just echo back to what kind of what kind of businessman is this? Uh, uh, next, uh, a man certainly of, among the most principled in the in the history, uh, recent history of this uh, country's congressional service. Uh, you say at the end of the road for Ron Paul, calling it a career. Yeah, that's right. You know, Ron Paul has suspended his presidential campaign, uh, and he's not uh, running for re-election in the House. Uh, uh, this is effectively the end of his political career, at least in elected office. Uh, but this is a guy who has really reshaped the American political landscape over the last several decades. He's brought libertarian into the mainstream. His positions, many of which are... are, are a a pretty aggressive, uh, a limited government vision uh, have become real touchstones for the Tea Party. Uh, you know, he, he's a guy who's developed a very devoted following, millions upon millions of people who are eager to give him money, eager to show up uh, at, at campaign rallies, at state conventions. And, you know, he, his following and, and the movement that he's helped create, uh, you know, won't be over with him, even though for all intents and purposes, uh, his role as an active campaigner in the presidential race is over. Uh, it'll be interesting, though, because he, again, he goes to an economic narrative, yeah. and so and his following. While uh, I know he had a difficult time growing beyond certain thresholds, the, the base that that man holds, as you and I both know, is among the most engaged and most loyal. Uh, and, and there'll be an interesting dynamic to watch as that that plays into this. Let's move away from the sort of high consequence politics and move to the high consequence business of producing TV shows. For goodness sakes, Ben. <laughs> Uh, finally, uh, TV land here, uh, which shows America will be looking at. Uh, and it's not just about what are the shows at this point, it's how are the networks adapting to this new content paradigm, uh, which is so much less attached to a new fall show and so much more attached to a three-minute video on their iPhones. Yeah, no, that's exactly right, Dylan. And as you suggest, uh, you know, the Facebook IPO hysteria and the mess at J.P. Morgan were not the only uh, big glitzy events uh, in New York this week. Uh, the four big networks uh, uh, staged their upfronts, which are essentially a uh, uh, coming out party, a, a dog and pony show, if you will, uh, where they, uh, they trot out stars and they let advertisers and critics uh, get a taste of, of what shows are coming this fall. Uh, 
16 of the 36 new shows will be comedies, which in, in many ways is, is something of, of, of a throwback. Uh, in, in recent years, uh, you know, we've seen reality shows, we've seen procedural dramas, and uh, you know, this is, it could be seen as a statement from these TV networks that they, they think their business model uh, is, is still quite relevant, even in uh, today's uh, age of smartphone addiction. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, listen, God, more power to them. I, I, I always enjoyed a good sitcom when they, when, they, when they actually existed. So, listen, who's to say we won't enjoy another one? Uh, ben, uh, uh, welcome aboard. Uh, look forward to seeing you uh, next week. Great. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, still to come.